test, 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 test. All right. Um. All right, um, record, start recording here. Okay, um, let's go ahead and start. Uh, Again here, um, hopefully um, not too certain of the recording from the first part. Um, worked or not. So uh, anyway, so um, I wanted to give a chance to talk then about this week's materials a bit. Um, so let's see here. Um, so as I mentioned before, I mean, this is kind of a important um, uh, week here because um, we're going to start talking about some of the details of how like linear regression works. Um, and it's important because a lot of the other machine learning techniques that we'll talk about fit into the same kind of uh, pattern um, for um, the, the, the details of linear regression. So, um, So yeah, I mean, in particular, also um, um, I had some materials about uh, gradient descent, which is so it's, uh, it's very important that, that you kind of understand these both of these, but um, understand the uh, concepts of defining a gradient for a certain space. Um, so so all these most all the machine learning me methods that we'll look at work in a similar way. So they define some sort of a fitness function, which gives a um, 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 space to be searched um, and then the the process of fitting the model is basically an optimization um, process so it's, it's basically searching through the um, uh, the, the fitness space using an op optimization technique uh, such as gradient descent to, to try and find the best set of parameters that um, optimizes you know your prediction or, or whatever it is that you're trying to optimize so, Um, yeah, so these are off of chapter four of our textbooks. So let's, let's go ahead and look at those here. Um, Yeah, let me just go ahead and rerun everything, although I can't remember if that's a good idea in this notebook or not. Looks like it's okay. All right, so um, so yeah, in, in, in a graduate class like this, I mean, it's, it's really, um, a good idea to kind of look at behind the um, the scenes of how these things work to, to at least understand it um, at, at some level, right? So, so you don't have to you have to, to get all of these things that we're going to get into uh, in the next week or two, but um, but but yeah, understanding kind of what's under the hood um, and how these work in general um, uh, is really helpful to be able to. Uh, uh, Correctly determine, you know, 
when things break or when things are going wrong to kind of help you understand what's going wrong. Um, and then to also to kind of help you prepare between different machine learning um, algorithms, um, what might work best in a given situation, things like that. So, so for, for many reasons, it's a good idea to have um, um, kind of this sort of understanding of, of, of how these models work in general, right? So, um, and in this unit for this week um, and in the next couple of weeks, uh, we're gonna look at linear regression uh, in a bit more detail and, and also a, a gradient descent. Um, because, I mean, linear regression is the simplest, um, but as I already mentioned, um, the same kind of concepts um, are used in lots of other different machine learning algorithms. So once you understand linear regression, you can kind of generalize that to, to understand lots of these other uh, things, how they work and how they're defined. All right, so let's go back to linear regression. Um, um, so linear regression is, is a technique to fit a line to a set of points. Um, well, it's fitting a line when you have just a single uh, dimension, a single feature. Um, it's fitting um, a higher dimensional plane or hyperplane. Um, if you have multiple dimensions as inputs, which you can do with linear regression, you can find. Um, linear regression is a regression technique. So we're, uh, the thing that we're trying to predict um, is some real valued number as opposed to a category. As I'm sure I'll always mention whenever, whenever we are talking about some specific machine learning algorithm, you know, so, so that's kind of a basic fundamental thing. You know, so are, are we doing a classification task or are we doing a regression task? So we're back to regression here. Um, so this is another set of, of data. Um, 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 so here, you know, um, we have a set of data where we want to try and predict the price of houses uh, based on uh, one feature. So the size of the house, right? So and again, if, if we scatter plot this data, I mean, you know, it looks reasonable that there might be a, a linear relationship, right? Um, I mean, you know, maybe we don't have enough data to tell. I mean, maybe there's uh, becomes a bit nonlinear um, as you get to really big houses. Um, um, they start not uh, going up in price as much. Maybe, maybe not. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I hope that you know how to define the equation of a line, that, that, that you've done this at some point. Um, so at some point when you took geometry or something like that, um, you probably learned how, like, like the, the slope-intercept form of a line, um, and then how, you know, if I give you two points, how you could um, figure out what the equation is of the line that goes through those two points or, or the line that's defined um, by those two points, right? So any, any two points will uniquely define a line um, in, um, um, in any space, basically. Well, two points in two dimensions will give you a line. Um, if we have more than two dimensions, um, you know, we, we would need um, corresponding more extra points to define a single plane or hyperplane in those higher dimensional spaces. So um, anyway, so, so, you know, if we have these two points, um, um, we can figure out uh, what the equation of, is of the line that, that those two points define, right? So first of all, for example, um, we can, calculate the slope. The, the slope is just the, the, the change uh, in y, it's, it's just the ratio of the change in, in uh, the one dimension as a function of the change of the other, right? So for every unit of x uh, that we change, how much does y change? And we can get that by 
um, you know, so we can figure out the slope by just taking the ratio of, of the difference in y. So, so y changes from th from you know 400 to 330 um, uh, between these two points. So, so y has a change in 70 as x changes from 2100 to 1600. So, so it's going to be like a 70 divided by um, 500 approximately. Okay. So that gives you the slope. So that, that slope is telling you that for every one unit change in X, Y changes by 0 0.138. Y goes up by 0 0.138. Um, but there are infinitely many number of lines with that same slope. So you know, I, I could just shift it up or down, and, and I have like I have a line with the same slope, uh, but um, um, you know, above it or, or below it, or with that same slope. So to to define that one particular line, I need actually two parameters, right? Um, so I need not only the slope, but I need to, to, to find out um, so one way we can uniquely define that line is is to find out where it intercepts. Um, so the location when x is zero that it's uh, intercepting, and you know, what the value is of y when x is zero. So that's that's what the intercept is. Right? Um, so if we rearrange, you know, if if we have if we've already figured out the slope, I can just use either one of those points then to figure out what the intercept is. Um, given um, um, the, the slope that we determine um, that must um, characterize this line here, right? Um, so if I, if I um, substitute in the, uh, the first point, so y0, x0, um, we find that the intercept is 107.6. And since y is measuring the, the price of the house in thousands of dollars, that's telling me that the y intercept is at one hundred seven point six thousand dollars. So when when the, when the house size is zero, um, um, has a starting kind of price of one hundred seven thousand dollars in this case, which you know might not be reasonable. Um, so I talked a little bit about this, I think, in, in the, one of the lecture videos here. You know, so so whenever you're fitting like a linear model, it might not be valid for the whole range of values. So, so you know, when, once you get to house prices or house sizes less than you know uh, 500 square feet or 200 square feet, I mean, you don't really build houses usually that small. Um, so your model might not really work um, in ranges like that, right? So. Um, okay, so um, if you have two points, that defines exactly one line. Um, so what if we have three points, right? Um, So um, what, what, what's the line that best fits three, these three points? Okay, so now we're, we're working on a different problem than the way we were talking about before. So when you have exactly two, two points, that uniquely defines a line. But, but now we want to know what is the best line, the, the best fitting line for uh, these three points, right? Um, and the answer to that, depends on what you mean by fit, okay? So, so uh, we need to have some measures. So, so we're, we're, we need to formalize what we mean by fit because we mean something exact by it. So, so it's not some fuzzy idea. So we're, just, we're not gonna just put a, a line in there and kind of move it around until it seems like it, it's a kind of a good fit for these three lines. Uh, we we wanna give some formal um, meaning to what we mean by a good fit here, right? And that's what, so, so we need to define what's known as a cost function or a fitness function um, um, to, to, to know what we mean by that. So, so 
So yeah, I mean, if, if you have three points or, or more than three points, how do we determine um, whether a line is a good fit for that data or not, right? So maybe this line is a good fit, maybe not, right? So, so I think that this was the actual line for these two points, but and those two points were actual points from the house data, uh, but now we're plotting it with all of the, the points, right? So was that original line that we had with that slope and intercept a good fit for this data or not? Um, So, um, oh, so yeah, so we could have used, um, like, you know, the logistic regression from scikit-learn again to fit um, the best line here. I haven't, I haven't determined, I haven't talked yet about what this cost function is or this fitness function is that we can use to define what we mean by best fit here. Um, but, um, uh, what you did in the previous assignment was giving the best fitting line according to some cost function, right? Um, or we could have used stats model, got the same line. Uh, here's another method you can use. Polyfit will fit um, a polynomial to, to uh, a set of data. So give it the best fitting polynomial, right? And if you ask for a polynomial of degree one, it's basically fitting um, a polynomial. So if you ask for a polynomial of degree two, you're fitting a polynomial of this form. So ax squared plus bx plus c, right? Uh, if you ask for a polynomial of fit one, you're fitting a line because you're fitting um, ax plus b, um, where, where a would be the slope, um, m and, and b would be the intercept again. Um, so if you use polyfit, um, again, I could have used um, uh, the linear regression from scikit-learn. I could use the OLS from stats model. In all cases, you should get uh, that the best fit line that, that they claim has a slope of 0.13 and an intercept of, of 71, right? If you plot that on here, I mean, the, the blue line was the, the, the line that we got from the polyfit claim for the best fit here. Um, so in this case, you know, um, um, I, I kind of said this before. So, so for this fit, again, it, it's good to understand what these mean. So the, the slope being 0.13 means that for every change of, of, of one square foot, um, um, we have a positive change um, in price of 0.13 thousands of dollars, right? Um, or um, so that would be what, $1,300, $1,300 um, for every square foot change here, or $130, whatever, so yeah. Um, and then the uh, the intercept gives you the unique lines, you know. So again, you know, if I only have the slope, um, there's lots of lines with that slope. So that one line that we're saying is the best fitting line um, has that particular slope. Um, and then if we go all the way to zero, like we did here, um, it's intercepting um, at um, 71 here. No, we didn't go all the way to zero. So if we, if we extended the x-axis all the way out to zero, um, it's actually hitting uh, the x-axis uh, when x is zero um, at y of 71 on the intercept here, right? Um, you get the same best fitting line if you use the LM plot. So that should be the exact same line with also with some um, uh, error bounds around the fit here. Um, So the general term that we're going to use is, is you need to think of M and B, the slope and the intercept, as parameters that we are using some method 
um, to um, uh, uh, find the values of those parameters, okay? So in general, um, we're going to, you know, so, so here's where we get, uh, gonna start making this a little bit more mathematical, but, but we can generalize that uh, form that we had before um, as two parameters like this. So where the, um, um, uh, the intercept is one parameter that we're calling theta zero here, um, and the slope was the other parameter. That, that's a, the, the slope is what you multiply by your x value um, in the slope intercept form of the equation. Um, and and uh, we just call that theta one instead of m uh, here now. Um, and then, you know, so the, the y here, we're given a slightly different name. So this is going to be the predicted value. So given some value of the slope and the intercept or of these two um, parameters here, theta zero and theta one. So given some value of these and given an input x, um, they would give you a unique prediction y here. Um, so the predicted value, right? Um, and, and those two values uh, uniquely define one line um, in, in this particular linear model here, right? So the, the, the theta zero and the theta one or the slope and the intercept of this line is different from the theta zero and the theta one for this line. Um, and we're claiming somehow that this line is a better fit than this line um, at, this, at this point, right? But they'll have slightly different, it looks like they have pretty close slopes, uh, but, but maybe slightly different intercepts, but the slopes are probably slightly different as well for these two lines, right? Um, so, and we can generalize this form even further uh, to when we have more than one uh, input variable for the model that we're trying to fit. So here we've only got one um, input feature, the, the house size and square feet. But if we have multiple features, um, which we talk about in, in a later notebook, um, in that case, the, the form of the slope intercept would generalize to, you know, we, we still have just one uh, intercept term, theta zero, but then we would have one um, parameter for each one of the input features, which would give the relationship between if we have one unit change for that feature, how that affects the, uh, the, the change for our predicted value uh, for each one of our input features here, right? So in general, we'll use n as the number of features, right? So in this case, we have n features um, in, in the general case, each one of the, the uh, one, two, three n features um, has a corresponding coefficient, theta one, theta two, theta three. We have an extra, we actually have n plus one um, coefficients because we, we have this intercept term as well that we call theta zero, right? For n features, we're going to have n plus one coefficients. Um, and then we can further um, simplify this form here using some linear algebra. So instead of this, which is kind of a straightforward um, uh, kind of polynomial, um, um, where each, each term is just raised to the first power for each one of our features here, um, we can use so, some um, notation from linear algebra to, to, to represent this form uh, just as, as slightly more in this more simplified way, right? So, um, we're going to talk about theta times x, where um, 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 x is our feature vector, uh, which contains you know the features x1, x2, x, x3, up to xn. Um, it actually contains uh, x0, right? So we're going to have a dummy feature. This, this is where the stats model, where we had in that dummy feature, uh, kind of where we first see that. So uh, to make this more regular uh, and to use this linear algebra form, we're also going to assume that you know when we have n 
features one through n, we actually have n plus one coefficients. We're gonna have a dummy feature x zero, which is all ones uh, in this case that we multiply times the, um, the uh, intercept coefficient here, right? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, x zero is gonna always be one. Um, and then, uh, so the, the, the dot product theta times x um, is where, so, so theta here without the subscript represents that we have some set of features, theta zero, theta one, theta two, up to theta n. You know, and again, if, if we have, if we're just talking about uh, a linear um, model where we just have one input feature, uh, that means that we just have the slope and the intercept, or sort of the intercept and the slope um, uh, backwards in this case. So, so theta, theta zero is the intercept, and theta one is the slope term here. Right. Um, so why do we do this? Well, we do this uh, for one, because uh, in this form, uh, we can build efficient uh, computational mechanisms that use linear algebra um, uh, to do lots of these calculations in parallel. So, so, so in this form, we can actually throw these onto parallel machines like, like uh, GPUs, uh, graphic processor units. Um, um, and, and greatly increase our efficiency for, for doing these kinds of calculations. Um, and there's other reasons, but... Um, so if, um, if the M best and the B best uh, came from our, our best fit for the line here. So, so I've, I've, I've defined uh, theta, um, um, theta one to be the, the, the B best, which is the, um, uh, the, the intercept and, and, and or sorry, th theta zero and theta one to be M best, which is the, the slope, right? So, so we've already pulled those out. Again, we haven't talked about how we figured out that those were the best fit, but, but we've got theta zero um, and theta one here in, in variables in Python. Right. Um, so if I have those, I, I can use um, um, linear algebra and, and like dot products to like to, to, to do my calculations, right? So given uh, a theta zero and a theta one, which was you know again the theta zero was the the intercept. The theta one was the slope here. I could put those into array big theta, um, like we have here. So, so big theta is just um, the collection of theta zero and theta one. Right? Um, and then um, if I have all my inputs, um, Um, so again, X had all the inputs, which was all the house sizes, right? And if, if, if I add in a dummy column of all ones, um, you know, to, to correspond to, you know, my, my, my X zero for my theta zero term here. And now X one is gonna be all of the house um, sizes in square feet for my input data here. So, so if I reform my X like that, and I renamed it big X here, um, right, so, so little x zero, little x one becomes uh, big X, um, or a feature vector, uh, at least how I called it here. Um, so now given a, a one by two shaped column vector um, of the, the, the theta, which is the parameters, the hypothesis parameters here, um, and given the um, um, uh, two by 47 shaped um, um, value of my, my X's for my inputs here, we can basically use matrix multiplication, the dot product to calculate the hypothesis simultaneously for all of these. Okay, so this kind of happens in parallel conceptually. 
when, when I do the dot product of the, the theta. And again, remember, you know, so this is just one particular value of my two coefficients. So in some, I know, so I, I, we've claimed that these are the best fitting parameter for the slope in the intercept or for the theta zero and the theta one. But when I multiply those uh, using the dot product times the, um, the well, the transpose of the X here. Um, so a one by two, and then I transpose that to get a two by 47 uh, shaped, I'll get a one by 47 result, which will basically be the, um, um, my hypothesized house price for each one of the sizes, right? So these should all end up being the points on my best fitting line here. So, so for this house size of, of 1,000 square feet, um, um, given the, the theta zero and the theta one for my best fitting line, it's going to have a prediction right here of, um, of a price a bit above $200,000. For a one thousand square foot house, right? That's that's my best fitting one right here. Um, or, or for my house with a, a, a size of two thousand one hundred square feet, that's basically right about here, two thousand one hundred, right? So uh, for this best fitting line, that should give me a, um, um, a prediction, um, the, the H hat, my, um, or sorry, the Y hat, my hypothesized prediction of about 350,000 price. So, so 350 here, that's what we're coming up. Um, you know, if you look at the first one here, 354 um, is the hypothesized um, house price um, for, a bit over 2,100 square feet, right? So we'll typically call that Y hat. That's, that's the predicted um, prices um, for my input data X, right? So we usually do, you know, plot the prediction as a line because the the uh, the prediction, the theta zero and theta one, define a line, right? But I, I could plot the each individual prediction that was made. So for each one of my house sizes, I end up with a prediction from the y hat. Um, if you do this um, dot product here, right? And we're just plotting them out individually here um, on this plot. Um, So yeah, I discussed a little bit. So you know, there's there's lots of reasons why why we kind of put this into linear algebra form. Um, so we can use a dot product here. So I already mentioned performance. So once you have it like this, matrix multiplications like this can be thrown onto highly parallelizable processors like GPUs. Um, you can get a big um, performance boost by doing that. In theory, sometimes. Um, but another is kind of this. So, so, so um, um, you know, when I only have one feature, I, I could pretty easily do this by hand, just calculate my y hat um, using uh, vectorized calculations here. So slope times my input x's uh, plus the, the intercept will calculate all 47 of my y hat values in a vectorized way here. But you know, if I have two features, um, um, I'd have to expand this to multiply my second coefficient times my my second input feature x two, right? And it's not um, uncommon to have thousands or tens of thousands or millions of features, right? In that case, you couldn't really write that out in code, at least not in vectorized code like this. Um, but I can easily represent that as a single linear algebra expression where theta has all of my thousands or millions of parameters for my uh, millions of coefficients for my fit. And X is a matrix of all of my millions of input features by whatever, how many rows I have of, of data. Um, so. 
So yeah, I mean, this expression looks exactly the same, whether theta is two parameters, two coefficients like we have, and, and one input feature plus one dummy feature, or whether theta is millions of coefficients and millions of input columns, millions of input features. I can still have the same calculation to calculate the predicted values from this, right? Um, okay. So we still haven't gotten into the 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 um, um, the answer to the question of you know how did we determine why that particular slope and intercept um, was was considered the best fitting slope and intercept the best fitting coefficients for this set of data points here. Um, and that's where we come into the cost function, also known as the fitness function. Um, and there's other names for this. Um, we're going to use um, a least squared fitness function here. Um, you can define other possible fitness functions. But the least squared fitness function is pretty common. Um, um, and a perfectly good one used uh, a, a lot of the time for these kinds of machine, machine learning algorithms. Um, so intuitively, you know, uh, again, if I can kind of scroll back like to this figure here, um, intuitively what we mean by whether a prediction is good or not is how far away the predicted value is from the true value, right? So for this house size here of, um, say 2,600 square feet, the true price was $500,000, uh, but we predicted, we under predicted a bit. So we were a bit off, right? But sometimes we were closer, you know, so like for this one, um, our prediction was better. Uh, in this case, we overestimated the price, but our predicted value is 600,000 um, and, and the true price was say 590, 590,000, right? So intuitively, what we mean by how good the prediction is, is, is the, the difference, the magnitude between uh, what our model is predicting and what the, what the true um, price was uh, for that particular house size, right? Um, so I could just take the difference of all of these, right? Or the, well, for one particular, um, house size, how well I did in predicting is just the difference between that and, and the, the true value and the predicted value. And, but that doesn't tell me how overall how, how this fit is doing if I just look at one prediction. So to get a feel overall, I kind of really want to, to, to see all of my predictions, say sum up. So, so if, I, if I find the difference between all of my predicted values, um, and the true values, and I just sum up all those differences, all those magnitudes, that would give me a, a, an idea overall of how well my, my model was doing in predicting these house prices, right? With the caveat that, um, you know, so I don't really care whether I'm under predicting or over predicting so much, right? It's just how far away. And so I, I had a very bad prediction for this one here, but um, you know, like a very good prediction for this one. This was a good single prediction, and this was a bad one. But but um, and and you know, um, this was a bad um, over prediction. I overpriced uh, for this particular house size, um, and this was a bad under prediction. You know, so this house for some reason is a lot more expensive than what I'm predicting here for that house size. Right? But it's really the distance. Um, the magnitude. You know, so, so, you know, if I just take the difference between these, uh, if, I, if I always just take the difference between my prediction minus the actual, um, so prediction minus actual here, we'll get a, um, a negative number. And um, prediction minus actual here will give a positive number, right? But I, I could take the, the absolute value of that. Um, so that, that's one thing you could do. Um, if you took this difference, so, so we, we call that like the error. So that, that's the error in our prediction. And sometimes it'll be below, sometimes it'll be above. So, so sometimes I'll have negative error and sometimes I'll have positive error. But if you add those up, if you sum those up, you're actually going to get uh, an error of zero for a best fitting line. 
right? Because and there's a reason why you get an error. This is this is essentially zero. It's a very, very small number. It's essentially zero. Error, right? So not all fitted lines will get an, an error of zero if you do that same thing. Uh, but the best fitting line will get an error of zero here, basically. So I don't really want to add up just the raw differences between the actual and predict. I want to add up the magnitude. Right. I could just take the absolute value. That's one type of, of a uh, cost function. That's known as the, um, the, the, the sum of the, um, uh, the absolute errors, the SAE sum. Uh, but um, um, we're going to take the, uh, yeah, I guess I did des um, describe that here. So we could just take the absolute value. And we're going to use something slightly differently. We're going to use the sum of the squared differences. Um, so yeah, that, that's the mean. Oh, uh, normally when we sum these up, then we take the average of those. So that, that this would be, if we're using the absolute value, that would be the mean absolute error or MAE. Um, but, um, and we'll talk about, about why in a bit more detail later on. So another thing, you know, if, you, if you square the differences, uh, so, so negative values, when you square them, will become positive. Of course, positive values, when, they, when you square them, will become positive. But in, that case, in both cases, when you're squaring, you're, you're getting um, a, um, a magnitude still. So, so things that are far away, when you square them, become even, even bigger on the air. And things that are close, when you take the difference and square the difference, um, um, the, the, the square of that will, will still be positive, but, but you know, the square uh, of the error um, won't, won't be as big um, as when you square um, errors that are further apart, right? So the mean squared error is simply, you know, in English, um, um, and, and then I'm throwing back in our notation using the, the, the thetas. Um, and here, x to the power of i. So that's not right. We're not raising to the power here. We mean the ith instance. Okay. So in our data set, uh, we have forty-seven houses in here. So so i is really just uh, the in this notation. Um, again, so if this doesn't confuse you, but this really means the index into the inputs x and the the input the, the index into the output y the uh, the true value uh, for each of our house prices, you know, so the regression label value here. Um, so again, I mean, this here, if I multiply theta times my x, uh, that is just uh, the same as the hypothesis, um, right? So that's the same expression. Um, as as here, y hat, right? So 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 having theta x down here in this expression um, is just the same as saying this is my prediction given some set of my theta input parameters um, and, and all my input values. Right. Um, so this is the predicted value minus the true value. So that's the error, and I'm going to square the error, and then I'm going to sum that up over all of my 47 values in this case. So we're using the mathematical notation for summing um, some sequence of values here. And then I'm going to divide by m to get the mean, right? So this is known as the mean squared um, error here. And that's kind of where the the um, the least squared comes in because basically, uh, um, so, so um, if we find the set of theta parameters that comes up with the smallest mean squared error, that's the least squared fit. So, so that's where the, the, the least squared comes from, like the stats model used, right? So, um, But again, notice, you know, this is parameterized by a couple of things. So, so the value that you would get for this mean squared error depends on what your values is of, for the theta, for, for the slope and the intercept, or the theta zero and the theta one for our specific data here, right? So, you know, um, 
if I have theta zero and theta one for this hypothesis, I'm gonna get one mean squared error. And that's gonna be different than my theta zero and theta one for this line, right? So this is a different hypothesized fitting line, right? Um, uh, for this line here. And, and I can have an infinite number of theta zero and theta ones uh, that would give a line that I could then measure the, the mean squared error of that line, right? But what we're claiming now though, is that in some sense, we formalize what we mean by a good fit, right? Because uh, if I calculate the mean squared error, it's gonna be smaller for a line that, that, that has, um, small distances between the prediction um, and the, uh, the true value. Um, and a line that that's, um, has lots of big differences between all of its predictions and the true values, that, that mean squared error is gonna be bigger because the errors are gonna be bigger. And when we sum them up, um, um, when we sum up those errors, the, the squares of those errors, uh, we'll get a bigger value, right? So that's, that's the claim for the mean squared error here, that um, when theta zero and theta one or the slope and the intercept are good, a good fit, um, you're gonna get smaller mean squared errors. And when they're bad fits, you get larger mean squared errors, okay? And if somehow in theory, if I could test all of the possible infinite values of theta zero and theta one, if I could find the one that gives me the smallest mean squared error, that is the best fit by my measurement, by my cost function measurement. Okay? And that's all that this optimization is, okay? Is that somehow, so we have to tell you how, how do we figure out, how, how do we search all the infinite possibilities of theta zero and theta one? But if we could do that, if we could figure out some way to, to search all the infinite possibilities, um, we could find which is the one that gives the smallest mean squared error? Okay, and, and notice that that you know that the 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 errors have to be positive. So the best we could ever do would be a, a mean squared error of zero, right? So again, if all of the these points were exactly on a line, and, and if our our theta zero and theta one defined exactly that line that all the points were on, all the errors would be zero, and we when we squared and summed them up, we would have a mean squared error of zero. Right. So uh, for a line or for data that has that, that doesn't exactly fit on a line, you can't get a perfect sum squared error of zero. There's there's all, but, but it's going to be some positive number. But the closer you can get to zero, the, the better you are on your fit um, using this cost function as our measure here. Right. Um, Oh, and then one final thing. So the, this mean squared error, uh, we often take the, the square root of that because the, 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 the sum of these squared errors, uh, the average of the sum of these squared errors uh, is still gonna be in um, a units so that are kind of squares of what we're trying to predict. So then if, if you take the, the mean of those squared errors and you take the square root of that, you kind of convert that back into the um, um, value. So, so, that, the, so, so we often, um, take the square root of that final result. We call that the root mean squared uh, of our errors here. You don't have to do that if you're doing like the absolute value is your cost function. So um, there, there's arguments for why the, the taking the square for these errors um, um, is good. Um, it actually works better um, in, in many ways than the absolute value. It, it makes it more sensitive to small um, effects, small differences in hypotheses and, and, and other reasons here. So, um, and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave um, you guys to read the normal equation yourself because I want to skip on to talk about gradient descent. So um, you can actually um, use um, well, algebra on linear equations, so, so linear algebra, uh, to um, specify an exact solution 
So, 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 so the, the, the question we have now is, okay, how do I find my theta values, my, my coefficients, so theta zero and theta one in this particular data that we're using? So how do I find those values that will give me the smallest possible mean squared error or root mean squared error if I calculate that, all right? Um, and there's an, there's an actual exact form that will come up with the value. So, so that's one way you can do it. Um, um, so, and you can actually do this by hand. So, so even if you don't understand this, uh, th these are just uh, expressions using the X input. So you take the transpose of the X inputs, do a matrix multiplication times the original X's, take the inverse of that, multiply by the X, X transpose again, and then multiply that by your, your Y um, um, labels that you're trying to predict. Um, and that will give you the, um, the values of theta that minimize the cost. Right? You do that, you'll see that you get exactly the same um, um, So yeah, I mean, if you do that, you'll get exactly the same um, coefficients that you get um, um, by using the linear regression, like some scikit-learn or polyfit or something like that. So. All right. Um, So let me kind of quickly um, talk about the basics then of gradient descent. Okay, so you know um, the, the 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 normal equation using the exact solution. It's you know you can you can understand it, um, especially if you're taking some linear algebra. Although really all you have to understand for this class is that um, um, that's a, a manipulation that gives you a way to. Uh, it define an exact solution for uh, the linear best fit. So that, that, that's a way to get the exact values of the theta parameters that minimizes the defined cost function, um, the, uh, the, the mean squared error, so the root mean squared error cost function, right? Um, gradient descent, um, uh, we, we often, we, we usually don't actually use um, the, um, the normal equation uh, because it has some computational performance issues, right? So especially when X becomes big, uh, when you have more than thousands of, of, of input parameters, um, uh, it tends to be um, the performance tends to be bad in order to count in order to, to uh, fit uh, and find the, the the best fitting line using uh, this exact solution here. Um, so instead, we use what's known as gradient descent, which is an optimization method. And, and actually, you know, I find that, that um, I mean, this isn't too tough to understand. I mean, it's, 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 uh, I talk a little bit about it here. It's, it's just an algebraic manipulation, but using equations of, of matrices, right? Um, but gradient descent is, is, is usually easier for most people to understand this optimization method. Um, so I'm going to skip over some of the, these things a little bit, um, but um, um, intuitively, um, if we um, here, I, I think in this portion of the notebook, um, I switched to a simpler um, set of data. Um, so we use a, um, um, we're just using these as our X inputs. So here, I mean, um, it's pretty easy to see that, 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 that so when the X is one, then, then the, the true value of Y is one and two and three. So, so th this, this um, um, is a line, um, finds a line with a slope of one. So for every change in value of one, uh, for X, Y changes by one, and an intercept of zero, right? So, so the actual line for these points is has an intercept of zero and a slope of one. Right? Um, 
And then also I'm showing here is that, um, um, so uh, to simplify, we can ignore the intercept, okay? So we know the intercept is zero. So let, let's just calculate the cost function, uh, the, 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 the mean squared error cost function, which is what this um, function is doing here. Um, let's just calculate that uh, only for different values of, of theta one or of the slope, right? So again, when, when the slope is one, the, 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 the line and, and the intercept is zero, we're always using an intercept of zero here. But when the slope is one, we end up with a mean squared error of zero because that line exactly fits um, um, the line of our data that we're using. In this, in this so that, that's the best you can get. But if, if you have a slope of um, a little bit bigger than one, like 1 1.5, you're not gonna get an exact fit, right? Um, so you'll have some error, right? If you make your slope bigger, um, um, you'll be even worse fit. You'll have more mean squared error, right? So if you calculate it, it looks like this, right? And of course, if you have like a, a slope that's smaller than one, um, you get the same error. Uh, because you're squaring the values, but um, uh, like you know, get the same as 1.5, but um, but on the other side, right? So you actually end up with a parabola here, and that's that's because this is a function of the the squaring uh, of our values here, which is why you get a parabola. Right? And this is actually a smooth function, so we only plotted it for a, a couple of different values of theta one, like um, so, like negative one to three in steps of um, of, um, 0. 0.6 or whatever we did here, right? Um, but but if, if you look at the true shape of that function, it looks like this, right? So, so the, the mean squared error is zero when theta one is one, and it gets worse and worse the, the further away you get from um, theta, from, from a theta one of one, from a slope of one here, right? And in fact, because, um, we're using the, the square of the, um, of the error. Um, our, if you were to plot um, um, the uh, values of, of your theta parameters to the cost, it will always be a, a parabola like this. Although in, in higher dimensions, so if I, if I were to plot it for theta zero and theta one simultaneously, it would do a, a bowl shaped value. And, and, and you know, and, and again, you know, I can have more than than one input parameter, right? So in that case, I have shapes that I can't plot in two or three dimensions. Um, so, so once I have theta one and theta two, and theta zero for my um, um, intercept, um, I can't really plot that in three dimensions anymore, like this. Um, but in all cases, um, uh, the, the 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 result is a what's known as a convex slit shape, and there'll be exactly one location on that shape uh, where theta one is minimized. So where the error, uh, the, the, the mean squared error has a minimum value, right? So what that means is that um, um, I don't have to search the infinite combinations of theta one and theta zero. Um, if I know that, that, that my cost function defines a parabola or a bowl shape like this, I can just um, search um, the, this resulting shape until I find the minimum point, until I find the place where um, um, if I go a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, uh, the, 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 the cost increases instead of decreasing, right? And that's really what gradient descent is. Um, and I'm going to skip over this stuff because I kind of want to wrap up here. But but I I, I, I you know so if, if you generalize this then to the, the two parameters theta zero and theta one, you, you have to vary vary theta zero and theta one simultaneously. But if you do that, uh, it gets a little bit tough to visualize just using two dimensions. But um, it's it's really in that case it's really a three dimensional shape that's like a bowl. Uh, but but this, it's, a, it's going to be a bowl that has exactly one minimum down there, where theta zero and theta one uh, will end up with the the absolute smallest mean squared error, right? And, and that's what we're describing at this portion of the um, of our lecture notebook here.
Um, and this is an animation. I don't know if I just rerun this, if it'll work. Um, so, um, Rerun all the cells above this. Hopefully they'll all run fine. Yeah. So um, hopefully this animation is still working here. So if we run this, um, yeah. So what what we're trying to illustrate here with this animation is that so here we're showing uh, kind of. Uh, picking a theta zero and a theta one at random. So for the first one, this one here, you know, we've got a theta zero of whatever this is, like a 1600 and, and a theta one. Uh, again, remember this is the slope and, and um, um, of that, right? So, so if, if you pick that theta zero and theta one, you're gonna end up with a particular value of the, um, of the um, error, right? So when, when you plug that into your cost function, you can calculate what the error is for my particular set of data given this value for theta zero and theta one, right? And you end up with this error value. So the um, um, the point that's discussed in here is that um, um, if I just start off with some random values for theta zero and theta one here, I can use a little bit of calculus to calculate what the slope is of my cost function at that point. Um, so, so again, if I go back to simplify here, so if I picked a theta one of 1.5, uh, you can calculate the slope using the derivative of my cost function at this point here. And that will tell you that I have a positive slope, which will tell me that if I go to the right, my error is gonna be increasing. But if I go to the left, if I decrease, um, my uh, theta one a bit, my cost will be decreasing, right? So, so by calculating the slope, which is just the derivative of that point, um, I can tell whether I need to increase theta one or, or decrease theta one to go towards the global minimum, right? And that generalizes to all dimension, to all of the, the theta parameters, theta zero, theta one, and more, if I have more than just the two uh, coefficients, right? So for each one of those, I can calculate the derivative of the slope of my cost function um, um, with respect to that particular variable, and that will tell me which direction I need to go, right? So then gradient descent is just um, calculating the derivatives uh, using the cost function, and then taking small steps um, uh, along each one of the dimensions that it tells you that you need to go to go towards the global minimum defined by your cost function, right? And from that, um, and, and that's the basics of gradient descent. And from that, if you take small enough steps, um, you will converge on the global minimum, minimum because there's only one global minimum for a least squared uh, cost function. Um, as is defined here, right? Um, okay, so anyway, um, there's a few more things that are discussed here that I think I'm gonna mostly skip over. So the, the the description of gradient descent here, we calculated the, the mean squared error for all, um, for example, for all 47 of the points in the data set that we're using as the example here, right? So that, that comes up with one, um, one resulting um, mean squared error for this particular value of theta zero and theta one right here, right? When we're doing gradient descent. And, and we calculate, and also, you know, for that particular value of theta zero and theta one, we can calculate the, the gradients, the, um, the derivatives of each of our dimensions at that point um, with respect to all of the data, basically. Um, 
So in real machine learning, often, you know, instead of having 47 points, we might have millions or tens of or billions of points. It becomes very inefficient to have to calculate the, um, um, the mean squared error um, and the gradients for all of our millions or billions of points that we have as data, right? So in, in that case, uh, instead of doing it for all of the points at once, we might break it up into smaller batches, right? And that, that's kind of what the essence of batch gradient descent is. Um, So, right, so, so we might take batches of say 100 input points at a time, calculate the, the mean squared error and the gradients with respect to just those 100 points, do an update step for our gradient just based on those 100 points, and then keep doing that with, with the next set of 100 points, right? Um, as, and as is described here, there's different ways we can do batching. So, you know, we could just um, um, pick 100 points at random or whatever the batch size is. But we could always start with the first 100 points um, and then do the next 100 points. And then once we've gone through all of our data, uh, go back again um, and, and, and start with the first 100 points. Um, um, but yeah, you should read the details about some of that. We'll, we'll come back and, 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 and see more about using these different things. For the most part, for using something like scikit-learn, um, a lot of those details will be taken care of for you depending on the machine learning algorithm that you're using um, and the optimization method. Gradient descent or something a little bit more sophisticated. Um, So anyway, um, um, the, the rest of this notebook is trying to show you that um, um, if you use the, this particular gradient descent algorithm, um, you should converge on the same best um, uh, slope and intercept for our set of data, right? So it'll eventually come to that particular slope and, and intercept uh, for our house price data. Um, although it might take a little while to converge, but um, 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 it'll eventually get down there. All right, um, yeah, I think I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up. Um, like I said, I'll leave kind of some of the details. Uh, we'll come back to some of these, um, the difference between uh, gradient descent and batch gradient descent and mini batch um, and stochastic gradient descent. So. Um, all right, anybody wanna ask uh, like a question about anything there? All right, um, if not, I'll go ahead and end the session here. I'll try and get these up. Um, I might have missed some of the first one. Hopefully I can see if I can get that saved and converted. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, keep working on the materials for this week. Let me know if you have any questions on it. Um, and we'll talk about the assignment, next assignment next time. Um, once I get it kind of posted, might not want to start on it quite yet. There might be some changes to the assignment three, um, although you can maybe look at it, but, um, but, but maybe don't start it in earnest yet. So. All right, that's it for this session. I'll see you guys later then.